27. That is the number of games that the iconic Legend of Zelda franchise has created over the past 36 years. And what an amazing 36 years it has been. From the 8-bit graphics of Link's Awakening to Wind Waker's controversial cell-shaded graphics and the breathtaking and immersive world of the Breath of the Wild, there's no doubt that the Legend of Zelda series has consistently been at the forefront of artistic style and technology. In this video, we're going to explore the artistic evolution of The Legend of Zelda and learn how its humble 8-bit beginnings evolved into a cornucopia of different and bold art styles that have gone on to define entire generations of gaming. But to really understand the artistic evolution of the Zelda series, we're going to need to start right at the beginning, back to the 80s, when the popularity of gaming was still in its infancy. Heavily inspired by the hillsides, forests, and caves surrounding his childhood home in Sonobi, Japan, Shigeru Miyamoto's explorations as a young boy ended up becoming his main source of inspiration for creating the first ever Zelda game. According to Miyamoto, most of his most memorable experiences was the discovery of a cave entrance in the middle of the woods. After some hesitation, he apprehensively entered the cave and explored its depths with the aid of a lantern. Miyamoto has referred to the creation of the Zelda games as an attempt to bring life to a miniature garden for players to play within each game of the series. This is where our story starts, in 1986, with the creation of the very first Zelda game, The Legend of Zelda. Back in the day, the original Legend of Zelda was designed to be stored on a floppy disk, thus the graphics had to be as simple as possible while still maintaining readability. Now, back in this dark age of game design and programming, these games were actually planned, designed, and iterated on, on graph paper, that's right, paper, and then manually programmed into the game, one pixel at a time. The NES console and technology of the time limited the title to a three color palette, and each sprite was only eight by eight pixels. Sprites were given different colors according to their location in the overworld, so players were able to see green or orange trees or dungeon walls that were either blue, green, yellow, etc. Much like how Mario was designed wearing overalls to make his running animation easy to understand, Link had to be massively simplified into a cute but fierce cluster of pixels. Well, excuse me, princess. While the style was crude and unrefined, this paved the way for every single Zelda game that came after it. In a 2012 interview, Shigeru Miyamoto disclosed that Link's original concept art took heavily after the Disney hero Peter Pan, as Nintendo's sprite designer was a big fan of the story. So at its core, The Legend of Zelda series is nothing more than a celebration of childhood and a manifest towards protecting those qualities within ourselves even as we grow older. Defeating evil is never out of reach as long as we preserve our curiosity and our courage. With these qualities in mind, it's easy to see the resemblance between our hero and the famous eternal child, Peter Pan. Of course, despite the significant thematic similarities between the two, Link does grow old. His character designs throughout the series showcase the ups and downs of leaving childhood behind and taking on more adult responsibilities. The original Link, as seen in the 1988 Legend of Zelda, didn't have much of an in-game design due to the technical constraints of the available platforms. Still, the official artwork shows him as a tiny, bare-legged hero with questionable sideburns. His design strikingly evokes cult favorites that were very popular at the time, such as Dragon Ball and even early Ghibli films such as Nausicaa, Panda Go Panda, and the Castle of Cagliostro. Fast forward a year later to 1987, we were presented with a revamped world in Zelda 2, The Adventure of Link. Now, some gameplay elements were altered, most notably affecting movement and combat, and we got to see Link's charming side profile due to the new side-scrolling approach. Fans' opinions of the new style were mixed, but this decision allowed artists to incorporate more visual elements into the game and maintain a better sense of proportion. While the overworld map had a similar style to the first game, the new elements were able to reflect a wider variety in ecosystems. In addition, each dungeon had a different texture and architecture, unlike the previous title. But this begs the question, and you're probably wondering, why did the game designers risk such a drastic design change in the look and feel of the game? Now, let me explain something about what makes the Legend of Zelda games so special. 
The Zelda series itself is unique due to its irregular and often changing art styles, with many of the comprising games varying wildly in terms of delivery and artistic direction. Each title presents its world in a distinctive way, and the design team is known for taking bold artistic risks throughout the series. According to my research, the Legend of Zelda games have had around 13 distinct art styles across its main series. That is insane. In this aspect, the series has always been a major trendsetter, and their complete refusal to stick with what works and just call it a day is what I think played a massive role in making Zelda one of the best series in video games history. Art director Satoru Takizawa explained the team's inconsistent approach in the Breath of the Wild Master Works book. He said, The conclusion was to marry the world's believability with playability. This would help them satisfy the goal of rethinking the conventions of Zelda and creating an art style that could be considered the definitive standard for Zelda. Now, that makes sense to me. The series became a thing long before the gaming industry exploded. In the years following the release of the original Legend of Zelda, we made massive technological breakthroughs, which meant that Nintendo had to reinvent each game to fit the new possibilities of the time. Miyamoto's primary focus for each title was the game mechanics, with graphics being more of an afterthought that would supplement the gaming experience. And since one of the critical goals of the series was employing all new technologies to enrich the player's experience, the art style had to support all of the changes throughout the series while still bringing something completely new and exciting to the table. This is why the design team felt so comfortable with completely revamping the style of the second game. As the 80s came to an end, a new era of gaming was on the horizon. With the advent of the 90s came the SNES, and one of my favorite games of all time, A Link to the Past. A Link to the Past made excellent use of the SNES capabilities and introduced more realistic graphics. More colors and textures distinguished the playing areas, and we even got some primitive effects, such as mist and the upper leaf shadows in The Lost Woods. A Link to the Past set the bar for years of Zelda games to come. Though the Game Boy couldn't hit the same level of graphical fidelity as the SNES, 1993's Link's Awakening heavily borrowed from A Link to the Past artistic direction, and both Oracle of Ages and Oracle of Seasons followed its lead nearly a decade later on the Game Boy Color, with a splash of extra color here and there given the new system. A Link to the Past's art is the retro style most commonly associated with the 2D Zelda games, and one that was briefly resurrected again for the original Four Swords when A Link to the Past was re-released on Game Boy Advance. It was largely iterated on and changed after that point, but you can still see its influence everywhere. The main character of the series, Link, also went through some considerable changes in the 90s as well, losing the controversial cross adorning his shield, becoming a little bit taller, ready to take on the more combat-focused approach of the second game. His official art stands out even more, with legendary illustrator Katsuya Terada including more western elements in his work. The illustrations themselves were heavily inspired by 80s comics and graphic novels, such as Marvel's Power Man and Iron Fist, Terry Pratchett's The Color of Magic, and even grittier anime series like Akira and Gunbuster. 1988 was a great year, and not just because Seinfeld aired its finale. Nintendo brought us the first 3D game of the series, the Ocarina of Time, for the N64. To design Ocarina of Time, Nintendo used a new game engine based on polygonal graphics that would later be used to create Majora's Mask as well. Storage space was still an issue, so the team worked around the difficulties in a pretty clever way. Depending on the camera's angle, each element only loaded the part that was facing it. An early version of the now commonly used technique called culling. Culling is all about reducing memory usage, and in games, culling is used to reduce the amount of work an engine has to do by only rendering what the player can see with the in-game camera. It makes a lot of sense. Consoles and PCs would have an extremely hard time rendering an entire game world, and they still do. So culling cuts down the workload by ignoring anything that doesn't fall directly into the camera's view. Thus, whenever looking at characters, enemies, or items in game of the Ocarina of Time, the game would loan only that part of them that was facing the camera, with nothing on the sides. From a modern viewpoint, the graphics looked a little bit clunky, but it's easy to understand why. Along with Majora's Mask, Ocarina of Time took a bit of a grittier turn when it comes to graphics, as the series adopted a more grown-up style that strayed from the classical, retro look that most contemporary titles shared. 
Ocarina of Time went on to win multiple awards, including three Game of the Year titles, and it received perfect review scores from the majority of gaming publications, most notably Famitsu and GameSpot. IGN said players were amazed by the level of detail of the environment, and it praised its cinematics and flawless camera work. For the first 3D game of the series, the critical acclaim was overwhelming, and set the stage for a very popular but controversial game in 2002. In The Legend of Zelda Wind Waker, our hero returned to his chibi beginnings due to the erratic art style of the series as it was navigating new technologies at the turn of the century with the release of the GameCube. Fueled by an infamous short demo played at Nintendo Space World that depicted Link dueling Ganondorf, fans were expecting an edgier, darker hero of time. This set the tone for an unpleasant reception at the following exposition, as the game they were supposed to get shortly after was the furthest thing away from Grimm. They mockingly called it Zelda due to the game's novel use of the cell shading technique. Miyamoto was surprised at the reaction to the footage, and the media's claim that Nintendo was shifting its focus to a younger audience, and he refused to reveal anything further until a playable demonstration became available. It was hoped that once critics played the game, they would focus on the all-important gameplay rather than simply reacting to the new graphical style. A former Nintendo illustrator and character designer, Yoichi Kotabe, suggested that the style was inspired by the animated film The Little Prince and the Eight-Headed Dragon. Miyamoto also revealed later in an interview that the development started after one of the illustrators brought the team a sketch of Toon Link that they all absolutely loved. The cell shading technique was used to mask system limitations of the GameCube and was later adopted for handheld Zelda games such as the Phantom Hourglass and Spirit Tracks. However, according to the series' tendency to break the norms, Wind Waker's cell shading differs from other games made in this style in a few key areas. The lack of outlines and use of detailed texture helped paint a beautiful world and give the characters a distinct flair, while the loose objects were animated using a real-time cloth simulation engine, something that wasn't being done at the time. Other visual effects such as smoking explosions, drawings that indicate the direction of the wind, and character and object shadows further cemented Miyamoto's statement that this game's art style wasn't just a gimmick. While the audience reception of Wind Waker was originally pretty prickly, as Miyamoto predicted, we were all sold once the game was released, with many critics ended up calling it a breath of fresh air and inspiring many other games for years to come. There are games coming out to this day that are still trying to mimic Wind Waker's iconic style. While most older games have ended up crumbling away and fading into obscurity in the modern era of gaming, the Legend of Zelda series has done quite the opposite. While Nintendo planned originally to make a second Wind Waker, they ultimately decided to satisfy the American market and give them the long-awaited edgy Legend of Zelda with their 2006 title, Twilight Princess. The serious narrative that was accompanied by a stylized, naturalistic art style that hinted at the Ocarina of Time and Majora's Mask. The details were intricate and closer to realism than Zelda has ever been before. Many visual elements hinted at a new fantasy direction, featuring a much more somber hero than we were used to. In this 3D era, official art featuring Link becomes progressively darker, an apt metaphor for the hero of time coming of age and facing the new challenges that come with young adulthood. Ocarina of Time, Majora's Mask, and Twilight Princess were critical points in the development of Zelda's particular art style, as they strayed away from the classic cartoon look and adopted a more mature art style. Artist Yoshiaki Koizumi, who was in charge of Link's design, originally planned a full-blown cartoon character for the grown-up version of Link. However, his wife was the one who suggested he take a more realistic approach, which ultimately gave us the sharp cheekboned hero we all came to love today. While The Twilight Princess wasn't as big of a hit as the other Zelda titles in the past, The shift towards realism allowed the Zelda series to break out of its mold, and it showed fans that this series can stand the test of time and adapt to a more realistic and modern look. A few years later, something amazing happened. 
Nintendo tried to reconcile the darker fantasy themes of Twilight Princess and the airy, optimistic style of Wind Waker and started developing these two games' love child, Skyward Sword, in late 2011. It seemed like Wind Waker 2 was replaced by Twilight Princess to make way for this one, a culmination of both styles, and in my opinion, flawlessly executed. Skyward Sword's development period was the longest in the history of the franchise, which isn't surprising considering the level of detail and the expert blending of the previous game's styles. The unique visuals have almost a watercolor feel to them, with all of the design elements managing to look both childish and sophisticated at the same time. Fantasy cues seep into the graphics while preserving a whimsical, natural quality, while Link's character design threads the line between real and cartoon. Miyamoto's love for impressionism becomes apparent as we're met with Skyward Sword's light tones, sketch-like feel, lack of clear contours, and bright, smooth textures. The director even went ahead and named famous impressionist Paul Cezanne as an inspiration for the world. This becomes apparent when comparing the quick brushstrokes used in both works to depict form and volume, and is especially true when talking about Skyward Sword's landscapes. The buildings, characters, and monsters inherited a shadow of a cell shader from the previous titles. However, the shader was a lot softer, as almost to integrate into the environments seamlessly. Seriously, I love this game and I love the art style even more. I remember a lot of fans being confused at the art style when the trailers first released. Not many games were considered art back then, but I really think this is one of the few games of the era that still stands the test of time when you go back and play it again. I'm really not sure if we'll ever see a game like Skyward Sword ever again. And with that, we're taken to the latest installment of the franchise. A truly special game, in my opinion. For the latest version of Hyrule, in 2017's Breath of the Wild game, Nintendo took models from all previous games and placed them into a development environment to try and design some mock-ups. According to Miyamoto, the team was inspired most by Wind Waker, thus that's what they used as a general art direction. Wind Waker's heavily stylized nature made it easy for the team to improve playability and suggest a small degree of necessary realism without having to sacrifice performance. One of Breath of the Wild's main goals was to mimic player experience from the real world. The art had to suggest possible physics and chemistry while walking the precise path between the heavily stylized Wind Waker and complete realism. The realism element was added with older audiences in mind. The latest Legend of Zelda wasn't meant solely for kids, but for the original fans like me, who were now becoming full-fledged adults. Moreover, the scope of the project, with its open-world Hyrule and several intricate mechanics, required a style that went beyond the previously intensely stylized versions. So, the goal of the Breath of the Wild design team was that we had to have the same magical Zelda that all the fans were familiar with, but solidly anchored in reality and neatly packed together in an information-dense, mature art style. The accomplishment of all of these was underpinned by the team's new slogan, refreshing and full-flavored. Now, with these two attributes in mind, the team went on to cement the final art style and give us all the same beloved tale of discovery and exploration in a completely unique manner that honored all previous titles. Miyamoto's team searched for ways to exploit the essential nostalgic feeling the latest game was set to evoke in older players without compromising on creativity. It makes sense that for a game with such a significant focus on exploration, they extensively considered many directions. The development process of the Breath of the Wild actually started with an 8-bit prototype that would allow most gameplay actions that you can see in the final game. This was a crucial step in rediscovering the essence of the original Zelda games, but in the newer context that the Breath of the Wild could introduce, especially with modern technology. Each character went through a laborious round of experimentation, as the team's main goal at this point was letting their imagination roam free and find the best blend of character design and elements that would best represent their already established personality. It was this free roaming and free thinking of creativity that we got to see a concept for a vaguely delinquent Link riding a motorcycle, as well as an elvish Link channeling his inner Legolas in Nintendo's book The Art of Zelda Breath of the Wild. While none of these revolutionary and awesome concepts made it into the final artwork, they are a great way to understand how vital the carefree creation process was. 
It also shows how much effort that the team put into creating a game that matches the fans' expectations without sacrificing the elements of novelty and innovation that has supported this series for over two decades. The soft, painterly effects of Skyward Sword, along with the darker, magical realism of Twilight Princess, were brought together using some of the unique mechanics of Wind Waker into a unique, absolutely gorgeous new world, preserving the legendary essence of Zelda and still managing to surprise us through a refreshing take of originality. The Legend of Zelda is a series that is very close to many of our hearts. And I think that the main reason isn't the gameplay or the charming story. I think it's the fact that as we have grown up and evolved and become different, better people, the world of Zelda has evolved and changed with us, almost like a companion through time of sorts. But it's also more than that. These games and even Link himself serve as a reminder of our own humble beginnings, of what we used to be, just kids, kids with dreams and hopes and a memory of a time where things were simpler. I mean, back then we had nothing but time in the world to boot up our N64s and just play Majora's Mask until our parents called us for dinner. It was a simpler time with no worries or stresses or adult responsibilities, just like Peter Pan and his lost boys in Neverland.